This program has been made possible by generous gifts from our friends of Cross the Bridge. Thank you for your support. title of today's message is Fight the Good Fight. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. It says, Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent am bold towards you. Let's look a little refresher. Corinth was a city It's a city that was huge back then, much larger than it is today, Uh, commercially situated, so there's a lot of commerce going through it, and busy city, a lot of finances, and it was kind of a wide open city. It was probably the last city you would think about planting the church in, but that's what Paul did. Paul went through there. He was called to go there. He shares the gospel. Some people received it. The church started to take hold and grow, and then Paul was there for about 18 months. Then he he left to go minister in other places. And, you know, we're all called into ministry. We're all called not to just a local ministry in a sense, but we're all called to a global ministry, if you will. In other words, we want to be praying for people around the world to receive the Lord, people around the world to know the Word of God. And, of course, here at this church, as the Lord is blessed, we've... um, you know, on over 500 stations and, and broadcasting online and, um, you know, people all over the place watching and, and people all over the place getting saved. And so it's an important thing to remember. And, but while Paul was doing this and wasn't able to be there, you know, uh, most people were supportive. Most people were behind him, appreciated him, loved him, prayed for him. But there was a portion that got into gossip and division and speaking bad about Paul. People speaking bad about pastors, just tell me it isn't so. (laughs) But that's what they did. And so we can learn. Because, I mean, we can all be tempted in that way. And it's so important because there's so much at stake. Now, as we look in this chapter, I read and study in the King James and then read to you from the New King James. um, And then I look into the the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew and the Old Testament. And in this chapter, there's some some, um, challenges in the translating the Greek into English. So... um, depending on which version you use, it really, it really helps to look in different versions to illuminate the passage. And um, a, a parallel Bible with a few versions in it is, is a great investment. Of course, now you can go online or there's Bible softwares you can have different versions. Uh, but we're going to refer to the New Living Translation a little bit while we go through uh, this chapter. Verse 1 in the New Living Translation says, Now I, Paul, appeal to you with the gentleness and kindness of Christ, though I realize you think I am a timid in person and bold only when I write from far away. Now, I want you to notice some of these words. He's, he's meekness and gentleness in the New King James and then kindness and gentleness in the New Living Translation. And let's understand, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is great strength under control. Part of the word picture is a very powerful stallion that yet responds to the slightest touch of leadership. So if you're thinking meekness is weakness, get away from that. Jesus was meek, but he obviously was not weak. And let's understand, that's, that's part of what we're called to do. That's something that we want to do. As we grow as believers, as we engage in serving the Lord, as we take part in ministry, 
you know, one of my goals in ministry is just simply to be a nice guy. You know, not, not, not to be a jerk or not to become a jerk. Because if I have to turn into a jerk to be a pastor, then the price is too high. Now, I'm not saying that at times I shouldn't be bold. At times I should be bold. At times you should be bold. But let's remember that the Bible encourages us to love God and to love people. And there's a temptation as we go forth and go forward as we get wounded to pull back or when we get wounded to have a callous come into our heart. But don't do that because what will happen over time, and notice I didn't say if you get wounded, when you get wounded. It's not if, friend, it's when. Don't get hard-hearted. Stay soft-hearted. Because again, it, it, you can't love God and love people if you're hard-hearted. And I've seen people in ministry get really cynical and disillusioned. And don't, don't go there. Protect your heart. Now, the first life lesson here is we are all called to love God, love one another, and to be nice. And if you're wondering where be nice is in the Scripture, you just saw it in this verse. Meekness, kindness, gentleness, what is that? That's being nice. Sometimes we mistakenly think that as we grow as a believer, we become more of a jerk. Don't know. That's not scriptural. Being a jerk for Jesus, don't do it. We think, well, if we really grow spiritually, then we'll continue to grow until we get our own street corner and our own megaphone. We shout at people as they go by. Lose, lose the picture that to be spiritual, you need to be rude. Because 1 Corinthians 13 points out plainly, love is not rude. Now, there are times when we're called to be bold. Paul was called to be bold. And Paul is not... Uh, He's not a shy person. And it's amazing that these people would say, well, you know, Paul is, is not very bold. And keep in mind, as we look through this passage, these next chapters give us an insight into Paul like no other part of Scripture. The first part of 2 Corinthians, first seven chapters, talk about Christian living. Chapter 8, chapter 9, Christian giving. These remaining chapters are talking about the Christian battle. And we can all relate to that because we're all in some sort of battle. We'll talk more about that as we go through here. But again, Paul's dealing with this remnant, not, not most people, but just a small remnant of people who were gossiping about him, putting him down, and saying bad things about him. And you can tell through the passage that Paul is, you know, he's wounded. I mean, you know, he's hurt by these things, but he speaks to him. He doesn't shy away from these things. And, and it gets pretty personal. And so we're going to, as we go through here, we'll get sort of personal and we'll also make present personal application of what's going on. And there are some parallels in the sense that, you know, God used Paul to start the church at Corinth, and Paul was called to be a pastor. And so, obviously, I, God called me to be a pastor. This fellowship started, you know, it, as a home Bible study in my house. And so, um, there's parallels there. And, and it is, you know, as I read through this, and God used Paul to start that work in Corinth, and yet he has to defend not only his ministry, but even his Christianity. Some of these people were saying he's, he's not even saved. So, man, it's kind of, you would think at some point that these people would recognize that Paul's the real deal. And this is Paul, wrote a good bit of the New Testament, probably changed the world more than any person out other than Jesus. Let's realize something, though, that they didn't see Paul's fruit because they didn't want to see it, not because it wasn't there. 
you're going to have people in your life that refuse to see the spiritual fruit in your life. doesn't matter what you say. And some of those people are people you care about, and it's going to hurt. I, I know that in this church, we, we had a, one family that came when we were down the street. First year, we were out of the house, and uh, they were there for a few years. And then uh, I made a decision, God didn't agree with it. And he sent me an email, and in the email, and by this time, the church is, is doing well, hundreds of people, people getting saved, baptized. I mean, it's, it's happening. And, um, and in this email, he, he said, I'm still looking for evidence and fruit of your ministry. And I thought, man, are you in the same church I'm in, you know? And, and then I realized when the Lord ministered to me that he doesn't see it because he doesn't want to see it. Because if he saw it, then he would have to submit to my leadership as pastor. And the people in your life, if they admit they see fruit in your life, then it's like, okay, what are you going to do with Jesus? And so rather than admit that and ask the question of what do you do with Jesus, they just say, I don't see it. I don't see it in your life. When we look at Paul, we see him being willing to be bold, but preferring to be nice. I think that's a, that's a great model. We, we see that with Jesus. Jesus was so gentle in some situations. But let's also remember, same guy, turned tables over at the temple. As we grow in the Lord, that should be our goal, to, to be gentle, to be kind, but always willing to be bold. Because after all, we've, we've been put in this thing, and, and let's understand there's no perfect people outside of Jesus. There's no perfect church. There's no perfect pastor. There's no perfect congregant. And I know people, they get caught up in trying to find the perfect church and find the perfect pastor, and they miss some really good churches and really good pastors because they're looking for the perfect one. Well, here's the problem. If you find the perfect church, what are you going to do then? You can't go. You're not perfect. If you attend it, it'd ruin it for everybody. So, even if you found the perfect church, you couldn't come. I've, I've often joked that I'd love to put up a sign, uh, only perfect people allowed. You know the tripping thing? <laughs> Some people would come. <laughs> I mean, seriously, they'd say, oh, hallelujah. Come on, Martha, we finally found our church. Of course, part of me as a pastor, I just love to teach the people that would show up <laughs> under that sign. But that's the reality. Now, Jesus sees the church as spotless because of his forgiveness and his grace. We read about it online, watch it on television, and hear about it on the radio. Our world is filled with violence and fear. Whether it's threats of terrorism around the world or senseless violence in our own backyard, our world is clearly broken and in need of hope. That's why this month only, Cross the Bridge Ministries is offering Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism. This special presentation from David McGee was filmed on the anniversary of 9-11 and is a message of hope and victory. This insightful teaching also exposes the truth about Islam's dangerous past while rejoicing in God's plan for our future. Join David McGee as he helps you and your loved ones to walk in peace and not be afraid of what the future holds. The product Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism is our gift to you for a donation of any amount to Cross the Bridge Ministries. Call today to receive your copy of Know Your Future by dialing 877-458-5508 or visit us online at crossthebridge.com. Things were going on in the church at Corinth, and any church is going to have things going on, battles and gossip and division and issues, and every church, I mean, except this one. But <laughs> even in the early church, even in this church at Corinth, things are happening. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul's writing earlier to this church, and he says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought 
and purpose. And then he goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to say, I've been hearing about the divisions and stuff going on. So here's an early church, great leader like Paul, but there's issues, there's stuff going on. So again, you would think that most people would be recognizing the ministry of Paul but they didn't because either they were re rebellious or there was some hidden motive or agenda. Now, some of these guys, it wasn't that hidden. They simply wanted the people to follow them rather than following Paul. Now, I've been in ministry, actually this year, it makes 20 years I've been in ministry full time. And most of it, over half of it is pastor of this church. And, and so I've seen things and learned things as I've been teaching the Bible and applying the Bible and the dynamics, you know, of the church. And again, I, I don't want to just make this a pastoral chapter with Paul or with myself, but helping you to see um, these things. But you know what? In, in serving God and fighting the good fight, you're going to be wounded. But the fight is worth fight. And the fight after you get saved is not about you, just you anymore, but about anybody and everybody that you can influence or share the gospel with. Now, let's understand that the enemy, and we have to believe in the enemy. If we believe in God, we have to believe in the devil. If you believe in the Bible, you have to believe in the devil. You have an enemy of your soul. And he doesn't know everything. He's smart, but he doesn't know everything. He doesn't know the future. He's aware of the Word of God. He's aware of what it says. He's pretty good at seeing potential in people. And if you have potential in ministry or you're called to ministry, the battle's not only about you, but it's about everybody that you can influence. And so these struggles are going on with Paul. And he's going to, in a couple of verses, he's going to talk about how this is a, a, a battle. And let's understand something, too. It's a strange thing, but people outside the church will primarily attack the Word of God. People inside the church won't attack the Word of God because it's socially not acceptable. What I mean by that is people outside, I don't know if God wrote that, I don't know if that's true, I don't even know. You can't really say that in a church. People will go, what? What are you talking about? Somebody goes, well, I'm not sure about the Bible. You know, in a church, people are going to give you a hard time. So outside the church, the battle and the comments are about the Word of God. Sadly, within the church, the comments are about the man of God. And the discussions around that. We see that in this chapter. We see that with Paul. Now, friends, Paul was an incredible leader, one of the greatest spiritual leaders this world has ever known. And if people doubted him, I think it's pretty safe to assume that people are going to doubt me and people are going to doubt you. But as we get in here, we'll see that it is more to it than that. Verse 2 says, but I beg you, that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Again, New Living Translation, this verse says, well, I'm begging you now so that when I come, I won't have to be bold with those who think we act from human motives. As we serve God, as we follow God, that's a spiritual thing. God puts desires in our heart to do spiritual things things, be motivated by spiritual motives. And again, we see Paul wanting to be nice, but saying, hey, I, I can be bold. And, and they're saying, well, he's, he's being moved according to the flesh or his carnal or human motives, the New Living Translation says. Let me, let me remind you of something again. We're going to draw parallels here of, you know, when we started this fellowship. 
we started in the house. There was no salary. I wasn't I paid a salary for almost two years. So it wasn't for the money that we started the church. There was nobody coming, so it couldn't have been for the fame and the glory. There wasn't anybody, you know, serving. So I wasn't over anybody. I was a low man on totem pole. Really kind of still am, servant of all. But, you know, it, so it wasn't a, a, a power thing. I didn't leave another church in a bad situation, inviting everybody from that church to what I was doing. So it wasn't a revenge thing. Well, what was it? I just wanted to teach people the Bible. I wanted to see people get saved. I mean, it was as simple as that. And, and that's still, honestly, that's still what moves me and motivates me. And if it wasn't, honestly, long ago, I would have been, I would have been gone. But it's what moves me and continues to motivate me. And so, and I find myself, and, and you need to understand this, and I, and I hope that you think, well, you know, Pastor David, he's a pretty nice guy, he's, you know, doesn't yell, he doesn't throw things, and you know, usually. And, um, and I try to be a nice guy. I want to be a nice guy. At the same time, you need to understand that there's a, I do have a boldness that I hope you never see that side. Because as I'm feeding the flock, I'm able to walk in gentleness and kindness. When I go to protect the flock mode, there's a boldness there and not so gentle and not so kind. Because see, I, I'm, again, I'm not a hireling. This church didn't hire me. I'm not the fruit of some pastoral search committees, although those can be spirit-led and spirit-filled. I'm here because I'm the pastor. And so when trouble comes, I don't run. I stand and I fight. And praise the Lord. There, as a matter of fact, years ago, there was a, um, I feel my wife cringing from up here. Um, we were having a conference and somebody came in from the outside and was handing out literature that is contrary to what we believe and teach. And somebody came up with it and said, are you aware there's somebody out passing this literature out, inviting people to their church? And I said, no, I'm not. And so... I went over to the guy and said, you know, you didn't ask permission to come in here, and I'm going to have to ask you to leave. And, you know, this guy didn't know me. I don't know who he thought I was or whatever. And, and so I said, you know, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. And, and he kind of threw his shoulders back. And I thought, oh, no, you didn't just do that, man. <laughs> you know, because... I won't go into detail. I wasn't born a pastor. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen and done stuff, some of which I really, really regret. But, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm going, no, no, seriously, it's time for you to go. And, and he mouthed off again. And I was, I was staying in the spirit, but there was a boldness that was coming up in me. And so the third time I asked him, I reached out and, and touched him, grabbed him, and <laughs> said, it's time for you to leave right now. Now, I, now, let me go ahead and say that now we have a safety team, and I wouldn't do that because, honestly, I ended up getting in trouble. But he did leave, which was the point. Um, and, you know, there was people around that they saw a part of me that some of them hadn't seen before. But see, again, I'm not a hireling. I'm a pastor. And I can go into protect the flock mode. Now, if there's a wolf or somebody that's hurting the sheep or being divisive, I, I slip into that protect the flock mode. I, I, honestly, I hope you never see that. Because if you see that, it means you're part of something you shouldn't have been part of. And that's something that every pastor, 
every Christian should be able to walk in this boldness because you'll be called to be bold at some point in your life. Now, the thing is, as we go through these things, and sometimes people say things and do things that hurt us, is to continue, and I, somebody early in ministry told me this phrase, and I love it, to be thick-skinned and soft-hearted. In ministry, to be thick-skinned and soft-hearted. Thick-skinned, don't be offended by every little thing that somebody says. You know, if I really want to feel bad about myself, I can just Google myself, and man, within a few minutes, I'm just... And every pastor that's involved in the active ministry sharing salvation could do the same. Now, but we got to be thick-skinned and not, you know, look, if, if, if you're, you know, well, five years ago he did this and she said that and three years ago he said this and did that. And two, you know what? Lose the list. Seriously, if you're keeping a list of offenses, you, something went off track a long time ago. Lose the list. Be more thick-skinned than that. But stay soft-hearted. Stay soft-hearted. Because if you wound up with a hard heart, you've, you've lost something that was precious. Whether you're up front or still seated or listening, watching from somewhere else, I want to encourage you to pray with me out loud right now. Dear Jesus, I believe you died for me so I could be forgiven. I believe you were raised from the dead so I could have a new life. And I've done wrong things. And I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please give me your spirit and your power to follow you all of my life. In Jesus' name. If you've prayed this prayer with Pastor David, receiving Jesus Christ for the first time, or rededicating your life to the Lord, please call and let us know. We want to send you our exclusive First Steps package for free. This package will help you grow in your new life. Receive your First Steps package by calling 877-458-5508. That's 877-458-5508. Or visit us online at crossthebridge.com. We read about it online, watch it on television, and hear about it on the radio. Our world is filled with violence and fear, whether it's threats of terrorism around the world or senseless violence in our own backyard. Our world is clearly broken and in need of hope. That's why this month only, Cross the Bridge Ministries is offering Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism. This special presentation from David McGee was filmed on the anniversary of 9-11 and is a message of hope and victory. This insightful teaching also exposes the truth about Islam's dangerous past while rejoicing in God's plan for our future. Join David McGee as he helps you and your loved ones to walk in peace and not be afraid of what the future holds. The product Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism is our gift to you for a donation of any amount to Cross the Bridge Ministries. Call today to receive your copy of Know Your Future by dialing 877-458-5508 or visit us online at crossthebridge.com.